Jack from Jack Bells and the Water Photography and today I'm going to be talking to you about how to migrate from a point and shoot to a mirrorless or DSLR camera. Covered today will be choosing your new camera, mastering your new camera, differences in the water and key tips. <laughs> ready for an upgrade. Let's talk about your options. Mirrorless versus DSLR. Now one of the considerations could be housings. Own brand housings, for instance this one from Olympus, tend to be cheaper. However, they also tend to be pl plastic and this might not be an issue if you only travel occasionally, but if you plan to use them a lot, plastic housings and the buttons tend not to be as durable. Here we have a setup for a, a larger mirrorless camera or a DSLR and with two strobes, a focus light, the housing and then a diopter, it might not actually make much difference in terms of size and weight depending on whether you, you go for a mirrorless or DSLR. Travel limitations might well be your deciding factor because a smaller plastic housing with a single strobe and a simple arm and tray, they may well be much lighter for you and that may decide which option you go for. Heavy can be also be a problem if you do a lot of shore dives. However, for to achieve better pictures, photos, you're going to need strobes because they make a very big difference to the image quality. A single strobe setup is generally okay for macro, although two strobes will give you more flexibility on how you adjust your lighting. Dual strobes will be essential normally for a wide angle because you're going to have to crank up the power um, and put these strobes up wide so you can't really get even lighting with a single strobe. Um, some camera housings, for instance CNC, do support TTL and TTL can be uh, a great way to get into a, um, a new camera system. However, you also need to be careful that they allow you to take photos very quickly and so may lead to your strobes overheating and breaking the flash tube which is inside here and that can be expensive to replace. For the best image quality you're going to need the best lighting that you can afford basically. Um, as you go deeper in the water the light levels decrease and especially if you're going into macro photography and you need to go underneath an overhang, the light there can be quite poor. And that's going to be a factor in focusing as well as the overall image quality. So let's have a look at micro four thirds. So this is a, an example of a Panasonic micro four third. You can see it's very small and compact. In fact, this one is the same size effectively as this point and shoot, the Olympus TG4. The only difference is there's a small lens jutting out. But if you power this up, the lens actually comes out a bit further. So one of the advantages of micro four thirds cameras, such as Panasonic from Panasonic and Olympus, well they give you a big upgrade in image quality over your point and shoot. Normally they have very very good video for cameras and it's a lowest price option for your upgrade if you do decide to go with the manufacturer's own housing. So that might give an advantage to Olympus for instance. The crop factor 
times two for a, a micro four thirds will give you a good basis for macro photography because the, the lens is going to be cropping down uh, and the, for instance, the Olympus and Panasonic macro lens is very good, very sharp. However, the issue with micro four thirds may well be the low light capability. And also, because of the crop factor, they're not quite as good or well suited for wide angle photography. But there are lenses that are available. Uh, for instance, there's an eight millimeter wide angle lens from both Panasonic and Olympus, which may well be good enough for your requirements. Now looking at an APS-C size um, DSLR, this is a Nikon D7200 yeah, and as you can see quite a lot bigger and quite a lot heavier than the Micro Four Thirds. Some of the latest Micro Four Thirds like the OMD, uh, Mar OMD 1 Mark II, that's quite a mouthful, um, those are uh, catching up with the size of the DSLRs, but still smaller and lighter. So the advantage of an APS-C, it's got a um, bigger sensor, and certainly for Canon and Nikon, a wider range of lenses, both manufacturer owned and third-party lenses. The vi video quality is not as good though, not as good as mirrorless. Uh, so if you do a lot of video, maybe that would point you towards a mirrorless camera. Uh, but they're, very, they're excellent for ma uh, macro and also wide angle photography. Um, one of the factors to consider are that they're usually going to be more expensive than a micro four thirds option. However, you can get some good bargains for DSLRs for instance, the DS, D7200, uh, and the lenses can be cheaper as well. So your overall price difference might not be as great as you think. So the other option will be a full frame. So I don't have one here, but a full frame uh, DSLR or mirrorless camera is going to be quite a lot bigger and heavier than this APS-C size D7200. And not just the camera body itself, but the lens as well. So again, maybe once you have all of the additional equipment, it might not uh, be an important factor to you. Um, but if you want to start small, then the lenses will tend to be quite a lot larger. And perhaps more, ex uh, more importantly, quite a lot more expensive as well. So the full frame DSLR and mirrorless is going to be your biggest and heaviest option. There are some other options, uh, which I don't have here. So there are some good fixed lens APS-C size cameras um, from Sony, for instance. Um, these are an, an intermediate step, uh, but they are more limited because you can't change your lens. So maybe not optimal for uh, macro or wide angle, but they are smaller and will be considerably cheaper. But it means if you want to upgrade again in the future, or if you need to upgrade again in the future, perhaps you're going to have a, a lot of new items to purchase, so uh, and also a new system to learn. So what about mastering your new camera? Key will be mastering the exposure triangle, so shutter speed, aperture and ISO. And that's going to be completely different for you when you're comparing your use of a point and shoot. Um, this basically has a few underwater modes, which you use an underwater macro, uh, two underwater wide angle, and then an underwater super macro. With something like this, you're gonna be maybe going into uh, manual mode, and then changing your shutter speed at the back, your aperture at the front, and your ISO via this button and one of the wheels. So that's going to take quite a lot of learning to do. Um, one of the ways that you can speed up that learning is to actually try 
auto ISO at the beginning uh, and that's good for land photography maybe not quite so useful for underwater photography but it's a good way to get you started one of the key settings for underwater photography um, aperture is very very important um, when you take underwater photos then the depth of field is very different to what you'll be used to on land. Um, typically with uh, a macro lens like this, this is a 60 millimeter macro lens, the depth of field and aperture uh, like four or below is gonna be razor thin. So maybe you're gonna get the eye in focus, but the tip of the nose is gonna be out of focus. Typically I use F11 to F25. Uh, F25 will give you the widest depth of field. Shutter speed will depend upon your shutter sync. So this one will go up to 1 over 320, 1 over 320th of a second. Typically I use a lot lower than that through experimentation. I found that 1 over 125th of a second works best for uh, these strobes. It uh, gives me the best results. Sometimes I get a line uh, in some of the uh, photos if I shoot at a faster speed. For wide angle, it's not such a factor. Um, what I do is I vary the shutter speed to get the appropriate type of background or the appropriate color of background for wide angle photography. So if you need a lighter colored background, you go for slower shutter speeds. A dark background you'll need a faster shutter speed. ISO 100 will give you the best quality so normally uh, stick with that unless there are some difficult lighting situations or I want to reduce the power of the strobe then what I'll do is I'll increase the ISO maybe to 400 or uh, a little bit higher but not too high. So when you get your new camera, if it's something like this, what I recommend is that you use it as much as possible. Take it out. Um, the macro lens here is great for portraits. So practice taking photos of your family. That's going to help you with your fish and critter portraits. So getting close to a frogfish or a, another type of fish, that's the same as a portrait shot. Likewise, if you go out and you find some nice landscapes to take photos of, that's going to be similar to a wide angle photo underwater. So the same principles apply, a foreground, middle and background. Normally the background will be a backdrop of water for a wide angle. But you still want to have a foreground subject to make the photo more interesting. And experiment with your exposure triangle. See what works best for the camera and for you. Then once you've achieved some mastery, so I basically use my camera for a, a few months, then I started to take it underwater and then you can take the lessons with you that you've learned from your photos on land underwater. So what are, the, what are some key tips I'd recommend? Use your camera as much as possible on land. Uh, I love photography, all types of photography. I'm into travel photography, street photography, take a lot of photos at parties and events as well. That's great for your underwater photography because it means your camera becomes an extension of you. And you don't have to think, ah, how do I change shutter? How do I change the ISO? Second, if you want to learn more about photography, make YouTube your friend. I found some really great resources on YouTube to help me. So I, I did a couple of courses uh, from Matt Granger, who was that Nikon guy. There was also um, some very useful information from Tony and Chelsea Northrop. Basically, they go into more detail on the camera. So maybe that's the first place to start. How does your camera work? Then they have some really good, more in-depth uh, videos on various aspects of photography, which will help you, or you can go into the Matt Granger series of lessons. If you're moving on to um, creativity and understanding composition better, 
then I would recommend Eric Kim. I really like Eric Kim's uh, tutorials. There's a website with loads of uh, information on ex uh, exposure triangles, the use of triangles, leading lines, diagonals, and uh, position of subjects for portraits, etc. He is a street photographer, but the lessons on composition uh, uh, translate directly into underwater photography. For other information about which lens you might want to buy uh, and some general advice, uh, there's a lot of information from Ken Rockwell and maybe you'd like to do a search. Uh, one of the things that helped me was finding what the recommended settings are when you start out on, uh, with, with a new DSLR uh, and I started off with those. I just made, had to make a, uh, one simple change and that is single button press for changing the settings so that means I don't have to hold um, one of the buttons and then do a scroll. So I just press the button, press the scroll, uh, one of the roll keys and then press another button to make it happen. So what are the differences underwater? First of all, manoeuvring your camera into place. So it's easy to take a photo like that. If, you're, if you've got a housing, even a small housing like this with a strobe, then it becomes more difficult to manoeuvre. And then if you have something large like this, then this is much more difficult to get into small places. So that's a consideration. One of the key changes you'll find is that when you're using a smaller camera system, then you, you'll, you'll use a screen. When you migrate to a bigger camera system, then you'll tend to use the viewfinder a lot. So here, I've got a, a good viewfinder. Um, if, if that's okay for you, then um, you can save yourself a lot of money because buying a, a magnifier to help use the viewfinder can be the same price as the housing again. The, why are you going to use a viewfinder and not the screen? Well, if you do go for the DSLR, the focusing and exposure is much better if you use the viewfinder for most models than if you use the screen. Not so true, or not true at all, if you use a mirrorless. There, a mirrorless makes no difference. So that might be a consideration on which camera you choose. Um, one of the key things is that you're going to want to set your focus. So maybe in your point and shoot, you half click and then recompose. With a big system like this, what you can do is use the button to change your focus point, move your focus point. Pressing the OK on this system will center the focus point. And you're going to want to focus on your main subject or if you're doing a close-up, maybe their eye if you're doing the portrait. Adjusting your lighting is also important and you can spend a long time trying to get the perfect light. So if we flick the diopter, then a lot of the time you're going to be diving in macro with this sort of configuration. So what you're trying to do, if the camera is a subject, you're going to be trying to kiss the camera with the inside of the light so that you get the best lighting from your subject and you're going to minimise the amount of backscatter inside your photos. Um, but this is a, another topic because it takes quite a lot of mastery to learn how best to use your strobes, how to change the power, and maybe even changing the direction slightly can make a big difference to your photos. So the last thing, I'll, that last piece of advice I give is it can be very different swimming with a large camera system compared to a small camera system. This is light and easy, so if you're swimming, diving with a point and shoot, that's easy to take with you. Whereas this beast, it's really heavy and it can take a while to get used to swimming with something like this and also adjusting your buoyancy. Here to help, I've got some floats. Uh, some people prefer the ones with air inside. 
Um, the disadvantage of those really is if you get a hole in, then maybe they don't work as well or at all. So adjusting the points of the camera will be important to help you. Um, another key thing is you can see this is the camera in hand. So if I want to change the aperture setting, I'll use this control dial here. But on the camera here, it's this wheel at the side. So you, you're going to need to learn where all your settings are. I've got back button focus on the uh, AEL -A -A AFL button. On the housing, that's here on this side. Um, another consideration will be if you do a lot of shore diving, this is pretty heavy. So that will make shore diving more difficult for you. Well, that's all I've got to say today. So remember, photography is not a spectator sport. See you next time.